Okay, we're pleased to have you all here today. I'm Cindy Bimby. I'm the Director of Communications for the Episcopal Church in Delaware. And before we go any further, I would like to invite the Reverend Jeff Ross to open our conversation and today's forum with a prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious and loving God, we remember that you called your disciples into a new way of being and a new way of living your love and service in this world. We ask your blessings now as we continue to live in this time of twin pandemics. Help us to continue to be your people of reconciliation and healing and help us to continue to embrace new ways of carrying forth the good news of your message so that we can make known your love to all. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Again, welcome and welcome to our 10,000 foot overview of church service live stream now and beyond. Wow, technology. You know, with this new emphasis on live streaming church services, oh, it can sure seem overwhelming, frustrating, and for me, uh, completely mind boggling at times. Uh, then I catch myself thinking, what would it be like and imagine it during this time of pandemic right now if we didn't have technology to share the good news of Jesus Christ? I, it's um, certainly worth pondering that thought for a minute. Which makes me think of uh, a recent sermon where Bishop Brown talked about, he, he said that he wasn't afraid of change, but rather afraid of loss. And when he thought about that, I immediately thought about live stream in our church services. That's what I was doing at that moment, actually. We, we lost the comfort of knowing how to do church or even go to church for that matter. Um, we have lost what was comfortable and that can be scary. But the good news today is we have people here with us today that will share their knowledge, their expertise during this 10,000 foot view, that's what I'm gonna keep calling it, of live stream and hopefully make it the story a little bit less scary for us. I'm not going to go and we're not gonna introduce each other today. I, again, I just wanna to stick to our format and try to get out uh, on, on the time frame I've set out there. Um, so we're gonna, but you can see everybody's name up on the screen. I see everybody has their name up, so that's great. A um, few housekeeping items that I want to mention before we begin. First of all, check out that chat box. There's a chat box on your right-hand side of the screen. If you haven't opened it, I'd encourage you to open your chat box during today's session. You can get to it at the bottom of your screen. You will see that Lola Michael Russell will continue to post um, Items during the presentation, she will post things that uh, relate to each person's presentation as we go forward. Right now, you can find, see that all the panel members' names and email addresses are currently in the chat box. We will save today's chat session and send you a copy of the chat session after the women, webinar. Speaking about today's format, following each presentation, there will be a question and answer session. I know you're going to have fabulous questions. I just ask you to hold those questions till the Q&A session. Uh, the questions will be very important for us and it'll be a good way for us all to learn and to learn from each other. So write them down, know what they're going to be, save them for the Q&A time. And when that time comes, you can ask your question by digitally, by raising your hand digitally, you can wave at us on their screen. You can place your question in the chat box and Lola will keep an eye on it for us. Um, if all that fails and we don't see you, I'm sorry, uh, but then just, just go ahead and speak out and let us know that you're there and you have a question. Because again, that's what's gonna be the important part of the day is your questions and hearing from each of you. Everyone has been muted. If for some reason you become unmuted, please mute yourselves back. It helps all of us have a very uh, a better listening experience. Um, again, if you have any difficulties during this and you can't uh, reach out, you, you can't put it in the chat box, and we can uh, Lola will keep an eye on that today. 
Before we go any further, I said we weren't going to do introductions of everybody, but I would like to uh, introduce today's panel, and I'm so excited they're with, uh, with us today and they're part of this panel. And panel members, if you can say hello so everyone can see you. So when they do say hello, their Hollywood Square box is going to light up so you can see them. And I want to start with Matt Tucker, who is the CEO for Pegasus Technologies. Matt, are you out there? Yep, I'm just going to unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Cindy, and good afternoon to everyone uh, on the call today. Um, CEO of Pegasus Technologies, uh, we're outside Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're heading into our 17th year of business. I have with me today uh, Nate Ferry, who is one of our account managers, um, somebody that works directly uh, with Cindy as an example. Um, so happy to be here, and hopefully what I have to share will help. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Nate. Uh, Scott Kresge is with us today. Scott is a member of the diocesan communications team and he's all things administrative and technology at St. John the Baptist Church in Milton, Delaware. Scott, can you say hello? Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, TJ Thomas. TJ is the music director at St. Peter's Lewis and along with the Reverend Jeff Ross, they are all things technology at St. Peter's and Lewis. Hi there, everyone. It's good to be with you today. Hi, everyone. Glad to be with you. So, Lola Michael Russell is a communications assistant. I think most of you know her. Or I've seen her name somewhere. For, she's a communications assistant for the Episcopal Church in Delaware, part of the communications team, a very important part, I will add. Lola? Yes, hi. Um, good to be here. And um, Looking forward to this, and I know that I'm going to learn along the way as well. So please let me know if you have any questions. Just write it in the chat box, or as Cindy says, keep a note and ask the question at the Q&A time. Thank you. Great, great. Um, also with us today is Martha Kirkpatrick. Martha is a candidate to the ordinary for our diocese, and she's also the chairperson of the New Normal Task Force. Hi, all. Hey, Martha. I'm also happy that Judy Gregory is with us. She is a canon for finance and administration, and she will represent the Barnabas Fund today. Judy, are you here? Yeah, I need to unmute. Okay. Anyway, difficulty to, with technology. I, that's it. No matter how. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, panel. Uh, it's so wonderful that you're with us today. Um, and I am gonna go through some things very fat, uh, quickly just because I wanna continue this going and make sure that we stick to our timeline. Today's program is gonna include things like uh, general information about live streaming, Wi-Fi basics, a few viable camera options. It's gonna include a brief overview on lighting and sound, music copyright information, information on the Barnabas Fund. Well, the Barnabas Fund is monies that are available to parishes for technology for each parish in our diocese. And there will be a time, like I said, for questions and answers. Uh, Martha, the task force chairperson is here, and if we have questions that we need answered by somebody on the task force, um, she will guide us in that direction. Uh, as we go through each presentation today, we're going to provide examples. I'll be sharing the screen so you can see examples, and we hope that the visual will be helpful. So to get started, I'm just going to be, begin by talking a little bit about some general information about why um, about live streaming. Um, I think the the heart of the conversation is going to be in Wi-Fi and cameras, but let's start with a few generalities. First of all, there is no canned option. As we talk about everything today, we talk about a 10,000 foot view. Just know there's no canned option. What works for one parish? doesn't necessarily work for every parish. My suggestion, uh, if it's possible, is to talk to an AV professional and have them do a site visit. If, the, if you can do that, that's great. Uh, if you know of a reputable AV professional that you recommend, please add them in the chat box. I think we'd all like to, to have some of those names to add to our list. Platforms, there's much discussion about what platforms to use. Uh, you will hear uh, the presenters today mention a few that they use. Uh, it's a big discussion. Uh, my colleagues uh, across the United States and other diocese, and I think here today, um, Facebook. We like Facebook. It, 
uh, may not have the moral values that you're looking for, probably doesn't, but it is a must have at this time. Facebook is the highest vis visibility, the quickest reach. And if you want to spread the gospel and you want to spread the new, new news and you want to do it at a far reach, uh, at a fast pace, Facebook. Along with Facebook, there's YouTube. And if you have the option to stream to multiple platforms, you absolutely stream to YouTube. It's a great platform. YouTube is really good for live streaming because many people who have um, smart TVs, they have that app right there on their TV and they can watch it. Uh, and it's very simple. You can certainly do that with Facebook, but you need to bring a few other connections in. Not quite as easy. The diocese chooses to, to all the videos that we do at the bishop, we, up, we put them on YouTube and then we upload them to Facebook. That's how, how, how we use YouTube. Similar to YouTube is Vimeo. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner look than YouTube. It has less advertising attached to it. You know, YouTube, you're gonna see lots of advertising. But the reason we don't use Vimeo is because it's a lower visibility. We just don't have the following and the greater reach with Vimeo as we do with YouTube. So Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo. Let's talk a little bit about camera placement. Um, each, pre each presenter is going to talk about camera placement today, but I want you just to remember when it comes to camera placement, don't be afraid to get too close. You can't really get too close. In fact, if you think you're close enough, you probably need to be a little bit closer. Um, I want to show you, I mean, see if I can, yeah, I'm going to show it to you later, actually. Um, it's going to get hard as we begin to go in person and want to get close up. Uh, it's, it's going to, it, certainly, there's no doubt to, we're going to have to maneuver more to find that the right spacing and to get as close as we need to get. But, you know, just think out of the box a little bit. You might want to think about having your speaker stand in the same area or uh, everybody from the same lectern rather than one over here and one over here. Maybe we all, everybody uses the same lectern. Whatever you do, you'll want to think about it. And um, we'll talk more about that later. Okay. A little bit about websites. Now, I'm not going to say much about websites uh, because that's a webinar all in itself. But remember, websites are more important now than ever. And they were always crucial, but they're really important now. Make sure your viewers and your seekers can is easily find your live stream schedule. I know there are some churches that have not put their live stream schedule up got to get it up there if you're having a live stream services now. Include your bulletins right there and your offering button. If you have a donate button and an offering button, I know uh, everybody's really hustling to try to get that. Have it all right there in one place. And remember, if your site isn't appealing to the seeker that's coming, it's probably not going to be appealing enough for them to stay and watch your live stream or, or to use your offering button or to become a part of your parish. So. Really concentrate on your website. If you need help, if you need any anything that I can help you with, please don't hesitate to contact me. I know Lola's put my number in there, my phone number in there, so call me at any time if you have any questions about website, how you might update, upgrade, or make any changes to it. Last thing I want to talk about uh, in regard to the generalities of live streaming is testing. Yeah. Don't test just an hour before you go live. Test days before you go live. Test the day before you go live. Test the day of going live. Test the, test the hour before. It's technology. So this doesn't mean all the testing in the world. It could still have a problem. But I promise you, the more you test, the more ease you're going to be and the less problems you're going to have when that time does come that you go live. And you're going to be much happier and much more pleased. So that's it for the general generalities of live streaming for today. There's much more to get into, but I'm going to stop there. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the program to Matt Tucker, the CEO of Pegasus Technologies, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about Wi-Fi and the basics that you might need and look at. So Matt, take it away.
Thank you again, Cindy. Um, <clears throat> as you said, this is really meant to be a 10,000 foot view. Um, when you talk about technology in any manner, um, you can quickly get to about a five foot view and then it kind of starts getting the glossy eyed look at people and not sure what you're talking about anymore. So I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, very high level, um, but also informative. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about streaming and we talk about internet connectivity and, and mainly Wi-Fi, um, I want to make sure that I, I also uh, share more of the recommended approach, which is the physical LAN or physical network connection. Um, Wi-Fi is great. It has a lot of capabilities, a lot of flexibilities, but it also comes with a lot of limitations. When we start talking about streaming in, in any type of media or, or any data connection, um, we always want to look first to see if we have the ability to actually use a, a LAN wired connection. And when I say LAN wired connection, physically taking a cable, plugging it into um, a device that gets to the internet. Um, that's gonna give you the truest, the cleanest, and the most speed. So um, when we talk about doing that, um, we gives us more options also to allow us to separate out traffic a little bit better. And when I mean separating the traffic, uh, we call it QoS, which stands for quality of service. Once we are involved in a hardline connection we're able to put devices in and actually separate out the traffic and more importantly give it priority so an example would be as you're streaming there may be other people somewhere in the building that um, are watching another youtube or uploading files to the cloud with qos we're able to actually say the streaming is the most important thing so we're not going to allow anything to take away that bandwidth so we continue to feed a consistent and reliable connection um, with that going into both wireless and internet uh, hardwired, we wanna talk about bandwidth um, and making sure you have the proper amount of bandwidth. And, and that is bandwidth provided by your service provider, whether it's Comcast, Verizon, or, or some of you in other areas of Delaware may have other carriers. Um, there's, there's a very geeky calculation to determine how much bandwidth you, you really need when it comes to streaming video and audio. I'll share it for those that feel they wanna take the challenge on but you wanna basically take your total video and your audio bit rate, add them together, and then multiply it by a 1.5. Uh, that math will tell you where you need to be within the band bandwidth chart. For the sakes of this call and a good recommendation is we wanna see a minimum of 50 megabits of, an, uh, of up tra or down traffic and 25 of up. Um, that's a very affordable connection and provided by pretty much every carrier on the East Coast. So then we step into wireless because in more often than not, um, you know, running wire to, to uh, the, the church or to where the presentation is going to be can be a costly uh, thing and, and sometimes not even possible uh, depending on the building. So we'll, we'll dive into wireless and, and get into some of the options um, to consider and, and some of the best practices. So first and foremost, once you decide on the technology you want to put in wireless, make sure you have a strong signal. There's a lot of things that can come into play that will, will um, degrade or change that signal, such as distance from you to the device, walls, um, the materials in the walls, uh, stone um, we see a lot in, in, in churches, and the stone will, depending on the material, you know, depending on the, the makeup of the stone, can bounce signals all over the place. Some of the older buildings too may look like it's a drywall or a plaster wall, but behind plaster, is or drywall is often a, a mesh, um, I'll call it a chicken wire from the older buildings. Uh, again, metal inside those walls can really damage uh, the signal and, and the broadcast of the signal. Um, for example, with Cindy, uh, the area where all of our network connectivity is, is one part of the building. Now, where they wanna broadcast or where they were proposed to broadcast from, it looks like it's just another room, but actually it was more of an addition and an external wall. So now we've got this external wall between us that we have to deal with and, and that puts challenges in play. Um, there is a, a way technology wise to do what's called a heat mapping. Um, you can do it on cell phones and, and even a laptop where you're able to download an application and walk around the facility and that will actually pick up your hot spots and your dead spots. So it will allow you to maneuver your access points or your wireless devices to get optimal connection. Um, when it comes to technology that self is the hardware, make sure you're, providing, or you're buying a high quality wireless device. 
Um, there's a lot of wireless devices out there ranging from $20 to $2,000. Um, you not best to go to a Staples or a Best Buy just to pick up the one that's on sale or has the rebates. Uh, our recommendation is a company called Ubiquity. Um, they offer a long range uh, access point and more importantly, uh, they are very affordable. They're in the $120 to $130 each range. Um, but more importantly, they allow you to uh, put multiple in and create what's called a mesh network. So you could have them spread around the facility and they will all look like one giant connection and seamlessly you'll be able to connect to the strongest one without dropping a connection, which is extremely important when you're streaming video or audio. Um, make sure the wireless network is also private. Um, you do not want to allow other people to connect to that device during your streaming. Uh, you know, more so before the COVID, we would see a lot of um, services go on and 100 people would come in and everybody carries a device, whether it's a watch, whether it's a uh, mini iPad to keep the young ones quiet, um, or a, a cell phone. Uh, and if they have your access key, which generally you know, we all give it out as a guest, um, that can really pull away the quality of your internet connection. So you do want to make sure you set up the specific one for your streaming and secure it so that just your devices are connecting to it, whether it's your camera, the computer, or your audio devices. Um, moving into some best practices there, uh, Cindy said it, um, testing, 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 always test. Uh, you know, if it worked last week, do not assume it's working today. Uh, we, we have, I don't know, Nate, what are we, about 40 to 70 tickets per day come in? And that's because something didn't work that worked yesterday. My Outlook didn't open or my internet's not working. So please make sure you're testing throughout and then even more importantly at the last minute test before the go live time. Another great recommendation is to designate a computer to handle the live stream um, and limit the access and the use of that machine. Don't use the general desktop that other people use or, or grab a laptop off a shelf that goes back on a shelf for other individuals to use. Find one, buy one, get one dedicated strictly for this, so that way you know it works well, you know it tested well, and no one's messed around with it between, uh, between testing. Make sure you have plenty of light at the area you are, um, you are uh, streaming from. Cindy said get close, close is good, sound is good, uh, but light in, in is very important. And I've, I've done so many Zooms and, and so many uh, web meetings lately, and. It still continues to amaze me the the quality of light it, it can quickly take the best of cameras down and, and just really make for a bad presentation um, and then finally include uh, your online audience this is more of a, a tip as to how to engage people which I know you you're all very good at I can see it here everybody seems up close and looking and, and, and having smiles but make sure you're engaging your audience at all times look into the camera, uh, address the online audience regularly uh, throughout the presentation. That's my high level. Uh, I definitely am uh, open and, and looking forward to questions on the back end. Uh, I think that's how we get down to the, the, the nitty gritty of, of how it would work for each individual. Um, as Cindy said, this, this isn't canned. Every one of you has a different building. Every one of you has different challenges to face and we just have to tackle them one at a time and, and put together the best technology for you. So, thank you. Hey, Nate, did you have anything to add? No, I mean, Matt really kind of, of, of nailed it and really discussed it. Um, I, I really want to emphasize what Matt was talking about when it comes to the testing, because these situations with internet, your YouTubes, your Facebooks, those things can change at any moment. So really, like I love to do the way I would do it is, is I do a one week, a one day, and a one hour test beforehand. Because the, it, it's one thing to say to a parish or to an audience an hour and a half before, hey, we're having technical troubles. We may have to delay this an hour or so while we figure it out. Then to put on the live stream and have it go wrong because the, the upfront honesty about it is really going to say that like, hey, we care. It's not so much about what message we're projecting. It's we're, we're including you along with it. Um, and I also include, Matt was talking about the, the heat map software. Um, I included a link in the chat 
to a, a performance a network performance monitor that allows you to do wireless heat mapping. Um, it is a 30 day trial for it, but it's fully functional during said trial. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool. Um, and if you're, you're not familiar with how it works or anything like that, you know, uh, it, it's a pretty straightforward setup. Um, but it's also good that you're pairing with someone who can understand the results. So, you know, as Cindy and I have worked together, um, I, and I just want to say uh, that I'm making myself available to, to all of you after this. If you have follow-up questions that maybe you don't have during the, um, the, the actual Q&A that we're going to do, maybe something comes up later or you want to do some follow-up discussions, you know, some, something unique to your church or a unique problem and you need somebody to kind of walk you through it, I'm going to make myself available after this Q&A after this meeting for anything that you may need. Uh, but really, Matt, Matt really nailed home everything that I was gonna say. So thanks for a couple minutes. Okay, thank you, Nate and Matt. That was really good information and I appreciate both of you being here with us today. Remember everyone, uh, their names and email are in the chat box, at the uh, top part of the chat box. They'll also be available during the Q&A uh, later on in the program. Now we're going to get into more of the heart of uh, talking about setups and our, well, I shouldn't say more in the heart because if we don't have Wi-Fi, we really can't do anything. Um, but from that, let's talk about camera options and setup options. Today, th there's many that we can go into. We're going to go into about four different types of options today that uh, the other presenters and myself think work really well and think could be a good option for your parish. First of all, there's the iPhone. There's using one Mevo camera with no operator. Uh, we're going to talk about using multiple Mevo cameras or Mevo, one Mevo camera with multiple scenes. And then we're going to talk about a professional built-in system. So those are what we're going to talk about in regard to cameras today. Uh, TJ and Scott are going to talk to you about the cameras. But before I turn this over to TJ and Scott, who have done significant work and research with a Mevo camera, um, you, you just find what they can offer you very invaluable and they've had great results. Um, but first I'm going to talk briefly about using the iPhone and iPad as an option. I'm not going to talk about this a lot. I think uh, many of you already use the iPhone and are, are going on from that. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the iPhone or an iPad uh, for live streaming. It certainly is the simplest, the least expensive solution for live streaming. There is no pre or post production. TJ and Scott and I were talking yesterday about the amount of time that you put into pre and post production. He said, so it's a lot. If you don't have the resources, you don't have the extra bodies to do that. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with live streaming from an iPhone. Remember the quality of image isn't going to be as good. The resolution is going to be lower. But hey, we're, we're getting used to that today. So it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting before we all wanted it to be perfect, but now we're all getting used to this more greenier image that we're seeing on Facebook and it's okay. Um, I know Lola has put up already four easy steps by Lorenzo Labrucia. It's in the chat box. That's if you want to know how to live stream really quick and set it up on the side of your chapel. Lorenzo um, is one of the gurus of Think Tank, if you've ever heard of Think Tank. Um, but anyway, it's a great video. Check it out if you, if you need to. Uh, equipment that would be needed for uh, an iPhone or a tablet live streaming besides your phone is a tripod. Again, you'll find that in the chat box, a, a really great tripod. A, a good tripod will make your life easier no matter which camera you're using, whether it's an iPhone or another camera. Uh, you'll need a mount to mount that phone onto your tripod. Look it up in Amazon. You can find one. You won't find it in the chat box today. A microphone. If you have a phone, you can get a microphone that has a lightning connector on it and just plug it into your phone. Works great. Uh, also, you'll find that in the chat box. You may want to check into Bluetooth, especially now as we begin with in-person worship and we have to move further away. Uh, there is Bluetooth microphones. You won't see that in the chat box today, but you can certainly Google it and look it up on Amazon. Um, and, and always consider lighting. Uh, that's a, 
a lot to talk about in lighting, but you can look at everybody today and see the different lighting and how everybody looks, good lighting versus poor lighting or in between. So talking a little bit about camera placement when it comes from mobile phone and tablet, um, you can imagine that I'm going to say get as close as possible. I know that it's going to be a little trickier as we go into in-person worship and certainly as we go into in-person worship you have to consider the headroom. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. I mean you have to consider the audience. Um, I'm thinking headroom. But when you're, when you're live streaming in person, consider the audience that is there to make sure that you don't uh, obstruct their view or are bothersome to them. But when you're thinking about uh, camera pl uh, placement in the video, earlier I talked about um, getting head and shoulders. What I left out and what's on my mind right now is also to think about the headroom that you have. It makes a big difference in the shot. Um, you don't want much headroom between the top of your head and the top of the frame. You want very little. If you have a lot, you can look around and see people that have more than others, but you begin to look, you lose that person. The person diminishes. Um, it's, it's much more compelling to hear the person when they're up close and they take up more of your screen. Okay. I'm going to share my screen and show you a couple examples. That's good. All right, so you'll see how, there's the camera. This is a picture of him live streaming. Here's the camera, and here's you see the bishop. You see how close that is. You know, there's not much, there's just not much room. So don't be afraid to get too close. Now, what does that look like? So there's still more headroom than I'd like, but trying to respect the six foot distancing, uh, this was as good as we could get it, but it's not bad. Uh, I don't like to zoom or move my camera around when I'm using the phone, so as they move further back, you're going to see it, it, they get smaller because, again, I don't. I don't zoom in when, I use, when I'm using the iPhone. doesn't mean that you can't. That's just not something I choose to do. I want to show you one more example. So what I just showed you was doing a live stream without in-person worship. Uh, I told you earlier we're going to have to be a little, uh, think a little bit outside the box when we set the camera for in-person worship. So I'm going to share my screen again. This was St. Peter Smyrna first Sunday to do a live stream with in-person worship. I thought for their first Sunday they did a very good job. You can see DJ is looking off at the camera right now. She has moved the camera around to the side, but she still has it close. Um, if you, if you let this go, you'll see that she's going to look back now at her audience here in a little bit. Anyway, so again, you have that grainy feel of, of an iPhone, and she, but I think they did a, a very good job. Good job, DJ, on that. And that's about all I have to talk about on the iPhone. There's a lot more to talk about, but I think if you, again, if you, that's something you want to get uh, into a bigger discussion, please give me a call. We'll talk later. I can tell you all about uh, streaming on an iPhone. Uh, the main thing I can say is test. Don't forget to test it. Test it out, test it out, test it out. Okay. With that, I am, it's time to talk about all uh, other camera options. TJ and Scott are going to do that. I'm going to turn it over to TJ now. And notice when we share these uh, screen with you and we show these other examples, notice the image quality of what we're going to show you now. It's going to be a lot better image quality for coming from cameras than it is the iPhone. doesn't make the message any different, but the quality of the image you will see is quite a bit different. Um, so, TJ, you want to take over? Sure. Thank you, Cindy. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the Mevo camera. Mevo is a self-contained streaming device. That's to say it comes out of the box and it's controlled uh, with a mobile device, with a, an iPhone, an iPad, or Android, whatever your platform is. And from the Mevo, you can go straight live to your destination, your platform of choice, whether that's Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, whatever your platform is, you can go to one or to all of those straight out of the box uh, with the camera. What, what Cindy is showing you is Easter day here at St. Peter's. Now, you might, if you've been to St. Peter's, you might say that doesn't look like St. Peter's and you'd be correct. Uh, we have the dual problem right now of 
being in the most significant renovation construction project since St. Peter's building was completed in 1855. <laughs> um, so we're there in the chapel of Absalom Jones. And like I said, that was Easter day. So we're just about a month into live streaming. And what you're seeing there is the Mevo uh, live streaming straight to Facebook. We didn't have it figured out yet how to go to multiple destinations. Uh, so that's going straight to Facebook and the camera was hardwired ethernet, um, not using Wi-Fi. As the folks from Pegasus said earlier, we were trying to avoid any of the complications with Wi-Fi in our brick building. So that's Mevo hardwired going straight to YouTube. There is nobody running the camera. You see the, the camera kind of pan to jet, it's a really bad pan, but the Mevo has a built-in algorithm that literally looks for faces when you're uh, seeing it on the the uh, mobile device that you're controlling it from, it literally puts a circle around the person's face and then comes up nice and tight on that person. And it automatically alternates between the wide shot and the zoomed in shot. Uh, that Easter day uh, movie that's playing back right now used only the ambient lighting in the chapel. So we didn't add anything. That's just the lights that are in the ceiling there. Uh, you can't hear it, but you can of course go back. I think we can paste the YouTube link for that video in the chat box. Um, the only uh, sound capture device was the built-in microphone that's on the Mevo, which is okay if you're as close uh, as we were there. The camera to Father Jeff away was probably about six, no more than eight feet, and it did an okay job of picking him up. The music that we used um, on Easter day was all played on a tiny little Casio keyboard uh, over there in the left hand corner. Since we couldn't be in the church, we didn't have the organ, didn't have the choir, the brass, uh, that was the only option. So all the music was performed live and picked up uh, by that Mevo camera. It does not do a great job at picking up instruments or voices for singing. It's really geared towards, um, towards the spoken word. So that was our, our first go at using the Mevo. It's something we actually happened to have uh, laying around here in the church office. And Jeff said, what do you think about this device? And I said, well, I've never heard of it. I've never used it, but let me get into it and we'll see what we come up with. So that was Easter day here at St. Peter's. Could we go to the next YouTube video, please, Cindy? So what you're looking at here is the seventh Sunday of Easter back on May 24th. At this point, um, we had gotten really familiar at using the Mevo and kind of fine tuning things. The big difference here is that the Mevo is running through a MacBook now um, into a piece of open source free software called OBS. It's a switcher software that allows you to literally switch between the Mevo camera uh, and pre recorded video. For us, that's what unlocked the magic of live streaming. It's also how we added those blue uh, lower third overlays there. Uh, part of being able to play uh, recorded video meant that we could now have readers and music that's not going on live. So we switch back and forth between the live feed and between pre-recorded. There is quite a bit of pre-production work involved in doing this. You have to edit all those separate videos and have them queued up and loaded into the switcher software before you go live and you have to have somebody sitting at the computer switching between all those sources. Um, at this point, uh, what you're seeing now, this went out to Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. I saw a question in the chat box, why did we choose to do that? Uh, basically because the reach is wider. We have some parishioners who aren't on Facebook and found getting into Facebook to be a little problematic. Um, while we had some folks like Cindy said, who have smart TVs hanging up, those giant smart TVs hanging in their living room, and the whole family gathers around the TV and can watch the service live on YouTube or at any time after the fact. Uh, to do that live platform, the, excuse me, the multi-platform uh, live, we had to engage a third party. There are several out there. Uh, one that we use is called Caster, C-A-S-T-R dot I-O, Restream dot I-O is another one. Basically, you send your live stream to one of those third parties and then they send it out to all the multiple platforms that you're using. Uh, you see there, I've got my, uh, my prelude there playing in the background with our slideshow. Again, this is all uh, pre-recorded, pre-edited, and then played back at the appropriate time. 
we ha also added a bit of studio lighting there. I think I literally took, we didn't have it on order yet. I literally took the work light I had in my, <laughs> my home renovation project closet at home and brought it in and put on top of a music stand. Uh, but it did improve the lighting for the camera. Uh, sound quality got a lot better with the pre-recorded uh, music, obviously, because we can control uh, the volume uh, right there that you're playing back. All those hymn graphics that you see, I took out of uh, the Write Song software and then edited them in with uh, pre-recorded hymns. I don't know how we got this lucky, but uh, I've been at St. Peter's for 10 years now. And every Sunday, I took one of those little tiny high definition recorders before we started hit record, put it on top of the organ console and just let it run. It was mostly for my own review. I never dreamed that they would be this useful, but now we go back and we're able to excerpt, uh, excerpt out uh, clips of the congregation singing hymns and then overlay the, the hymnal graphic, uh, which is really pretty neat. The only other uh, sound improvement we made was the purchase. I think you can probably see it there. If you look just in front of me while I'm reading, um, there's a microphone, a USB microphone that we plugged directly into the Mevo that really uh, brought the quality up on the spoken word. You can hear crystal clear uh, what that person's saying. So those are the, the two setups that we had with Mevo. The first one on Easter day was just straight out of the box, letting it run and do its thing. And then what you're seeing now, which is uh, quite a bit of, of pre-production work and running the Mevo through a switcher software for a bit more of a dynamic presentation. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Scott Kresge now, who's going to talk a little more about the Mevo and how they use it uh, at St. John the Baptist in Milton. Scott? Thank you, TJ. Um, we at St. John the Baptist started immediately in March with the iPhone, um, but we are using our space a little differently, and we realized quickly that the iPhone would not work. The sanctuary is about 30 foot wide and we tend to use the whole space of, of the chancel. So I was doing some research and stumbled across the Mevo and I knew that it would allow me to zoom in and do different scenes. So we actually set up scenes. We don't let the algorithm take over. I set them up ahead of time. Um, it's in a grid sort of like the zoom here you would see, you would see your different scenes. And uh, as the service goes, I'm also the organist, so I'm sitting behind the organ. I can actually select which scene I want at any given time. If it's the pulpit, the lectern, um, a tight end shot of the chancel, or when we come out and actually do the gospel reading. Um, Father Tom Erector decided that we were going to be doing a hybrid service at some point, so we were going to when we put our system in, we wanted it to be something that we wouldn't have to readapt to, that we would be putting a system in that we were going to build upon and go forward with. Um, I knew there was um, opportunity to add more Mevos down the road, so we started with the one Mevo Plus with a boost, and uh, we just, we do our whole service currently with the one Mevo, um, but we're actually installing four more Mevos that will be able to, um, this is just with the one Mevo. It spans the 30 foot fairly nicely, good quality. And uh, Cindy will scrub through and you can see some of the different scenes we have, um, the close-ups. Um, now, the placement for this is a little far back. It's about 15 to 20 feet, which is pretty far for the Mevo, but we're actually still getting good quality. The plan is going to be to have a Mevo on either side of the sanctuary, one in the center, one that will float for anything we need specially, and then we're gonna have one in the back of the nave angled forward for any um, full scenes that we would need. Um, the Mevo app right now pretty much runs on your phone or your tablet. That's how you control the scenes. I don't think that's showing the scenes, is it, Cindy? I can't, I can't get it to go. It's okay. Why don't, can you bring up the still with the seven scenes on it? Sure, I can. How about that? Well, right. That'll help, yeah. Well, that shows you where the placement is. Um, that's the, there we go. Um, 
that's what I see on my device at the, the organ. And uh, I can zoom in on the lectern, the pulpit, the chancel shot, um, whenever we, we change, whenever we change, uh, want to close up in a different spot. Now the Mevo app is getting an upgrade this summer that will actually allow you to be able to control multiple cameras with multiple scenes um, from all in the same app. Um, it's in beta test right now, but that will give you a true multi-cam, multi-scene. So you can have seven to nine different scenes and four different cameras and be able to go through and select which scene from which camera you would want. Um, our plan is we want the same ability as um, TJ and St. Peter's um, to be able to have inserted videos, graphic overlays, stuff like that. So our plan is we are going to feed our, our stream through a MacBook Pro with OBS and we're going to actually be able to control the scenes um, from within OBS, as well as you can do the, the zooms and stuff with your iOS device um, on your individual. So, like I said, this is, right now, we're currently running a little bit farther away than we want um, for quality. Um, we have all the stuff in and we're doing testing, 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 like everyone says, you've got to do testing. Um, especially when you start putting it through a computer or another, uh, adding another device to it. Um, with that being said, sound. Um, individually with the one camera, um, the, the microphone on the Mevos are not the best, but if you have an extra iOS or Android device, there is another add-on app called the Mevo Mic and you can put a small little condenser, Cindy was talking about using it if you're gonna do from the iPhone for streaming. I can show you here, they're very small. Um, this helps out tremendously because you can actually take an external sound into your app and you can adjust the mixer and make that your predominant sound over your microphone from your camera. Um, what we're planning on doing is we have a PA system and we are going to actually run the PA system through a USB mixer and plug it directly into the stream where we can control the levels of all the mics, the lapel mics. Uh, we're gonna have an ambient mic out in the congregation. Um, it'll give us complete control over all the sound going directly out. All of our camera placements will be off to the side, out of view, so that when we have in person, it will not be obstructed. We will continue doing both simultaneously. The last thing I wanna to talk to you about is lighting. Lighting is very important, um, especially when you're dealing with the Mevo because you're using digital zooming and digital zooming when you don't have good light can get very grainy. Um, also, if you're, it, that's where it's better if you can have it placed um, closer to your, your, your object. Um, if you're going to, we, we decided early on we were not going to go with any temporary lighting because we were using the space as if we were having in-person worship so that we wouldn't have to edit anything. Our, our uh, chancel is just a little bit dark. We're going to have redirectional of our spots and then take it from there because um, in about two weeks when we go to the other system, when you see from the back of the nave, if you have any studio lighting or anything special, it will show up on the camera and we didn't want that. Plus, if you have in-person worship, you don't want any kind of temporary or studio lighting. You have to work on a more permanent fix if you have a trouble spot. Um, that varies case by case. Ours, we only have a problem up in the actual chance a little bit. So, um, I think that's about all I have. I'm gonna to toss it back to TJ, who's gonna talk about taking it up one more level and having a professional system installed. Thanks, Scott. So as I alluded earlier, um, here at St. Peter's, we um, are in the midst of a significant renovation project to our 1855 building. And part of the project that we were planning all along 
was the installation of a commercial grade uh, sound system and video broadcast capability. Everything we've talked about up till now is what I would consider to be a consumer grade uh, product. So that's stuff that you can easily order off Amazon, uh, you know, iPhone, Nevo, all that stuff is easily uh, able, you can get it quite quickly and it works pretty well out of the box. The next step up from all this is a customized professional installation of camera and audio equipment uh, in your building. This stuff is hardwired and produces a really fantastic result. If you've ever uh, seen the live stream, I think right now we're looking at Christchurch Cathedral in Houston. This is a customized multi-camera uh, commercial grade setup. If you've seen the live stream from Washington National Cathedral, that's what that is. They also have a um, dedicated team of paid staff that run production on that. So th this is quite a step up uh, from the consumer grade equipment. It's so highly customized, it's hard to even point to what kinds of, you know, specifically what products might work in your application. Um, but in today's environment where you know, it, it's so uncertain about bringing people together uh, in the same room. We felt it was the right choice here at St. Peter's to go ahead and make an investment in putting this type of system uh, into the building. It is a significant investment of resources to put this kind of system in, but it does yield the highest quality uh, result. And of course, with a system like this, you can broadcast to your platform or platforms of choice, which is what we'll be doing. I can't speak personally about this because it's not in. Uh, the wiring's going in as I speak right now. And uh, hopefully by September, we'll be able to share with you a uh, firsthand experience of putting in and using a system uh, like this one. So I won't say a whole lot more other than uh, Mid-South Audio, who I think their uh, information is over on the right, is the contractor we chose down here in Southern Delaware, but I'm sure there are folks uh, in other areas uh, that do similar work. Again, this is highly customized and tailored just to your building. Um, the next thing I'll, I'll speak to is music copyright. Uh, after all, that's I am a musician first and foremost by training. All this kind of not, uh, live stream stuff I've come into uh, just lately, like so many of us have uh, in the last three or four months or so. Specifically, uh, what I'd like to speak to about music is copyright law. And it's definitely a, uh, a difficult thing to figure out. I would commend to your reading an article written by David Skop. Uh, David had, wears two hats. His first hat is as canon musician uh, for Trinity Cathedral in Pittsburgh. And he is also the owner and publisher of Sela Publishing Company, which uh, publishes a lot of fantastic uh, church music, especially geared towards the Episcopal Church. And David wrote a wonderful article that's on the Association of Anglican Musicians website, uh, where he speaks to copyright, uh, church music copyright law, both from the perspective of a working church musician as well as a music publisher. So I commend that you're reading. It's a great place to start. Uh, the other two links that are there, one license David refers to in his article, as well as CCLI. Um, in my experience here at St. Peter's, the type of repertoire that we do, uh, choral music and hymns and organ music, most of it tends to be covered by uh, one license. CCLI, ha the music that they cover uh, is more of an evangelical flavor uh, than, than one license. But if you're trying to cover as much as possible, uh, you do need, unfortunately, more than, more than one license. Uh, a good starting place to look at copyright law are those footnotes uh, at the bottom, uh, specifically for hymns. It'll tell you if the words and or music are under copyright. In addition to those footnotes under the hymns, at the back of the, every copy of the 1982 hymnal is a full listing of uh, copyright notices. And that's where you'll find out whether or not it's okay uh, to broadcast that hymn on your live stream, uh, provided that it's covered by one of the licenses that you hold. There is quite a bit of erroneous copyright flagging out there. We found this specifically on YouTube. Um, you know, We will uh, play back a recording of a hymn where both the text and the tune are in public domain, which in the US means that the, uh, the composer, or, uh, the author of the text 
uh, has been dead for at least 70 years. Uh, that's the copyright normative law. And even then it sometimes gets flagged and there's no way it can be flagged because the person who wrote the music has been dead for 350 years, but they still flag it <laughs> erroneously. You can dispute it, uh, which I do almost every Sunday now, and they take it off. It doesn't usually affect um, your copyright strike on YouTube. It just means you can't make money off the live stream. Uh, but definitely David Scott's article uh, on the OM website is a great starting place um, for uh, reading about copyright. And with that, I think I'll turn this over to Judy Gregory, who's going to talk about the Barnabas Fund. Well, before you, hold oh, on. Sorry, Cindy, yep. No, that's all right. Before we get off the Mevo cameras, Scott, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it as I was trying to share the screen, but did you yep. talk about you're going to, you were showing one camera, but you're gonna buy five Mevo cameras. So the sample example we were showing was just with one. That was just with the one. We have not, yes, we're installing, there's four more starts because the Mevo pluses are gone now. You can get used ones or refurbished ones. The Mevo start is the only one you can get. Um, it's actually a little bit better microphone system, but you still wanna go through another way of getting your sound in. Um, but we will be using four starts and the plus together simultaneously. So you can have multi-scene for each camera and multi-cam as well. So what he showed you was pretty dynamic, but you can imagine he's going to add four cameras. So Scott, can you tell us a little bit about the cost that you paid for those five cameras and what they came with so people The cameras are $399 each, $399. Now we did, we did just get, um, cause we want them hardwired. Um, the, the power over ethernet, um, it gives you ethernet and power into the start. The adapters are 149 each. So that takes it up a bit. Um, but we will have everything hardwired into our, um, network. And your total package cost how much? Um, about $3,000. And that includes uh, sound. That includes the sound, that includes the cameras, that includes everything. Okay, thank you. I had one thing there, Cindy, sorry. Um, on the power over Ethernet, you can also buy a power over Ethernet switch, which will yeah. make it so you have less devices in line, and they would be a little less expensive than per device. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. That's but you have to have the adapter for each camera. Okay, so I, I say that all because I see that the price is going about a professional system. So you can see the difference between the professional systems that are built in and what Scott was just talking about. And what Scott is doing is, is pretty impressive. And as what TJ is doing is really impressive. And, uh, anyway, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And now we'll throw it to you, Judy Gregory. And that's great because I'm going to make everyone's day. <laughs> yes, you always all right. You, you, let's just say that it was 3,500. One of the responses that has come out during uh, this age of COVID is that the Barnabas Fund, which has been set up um, and is uh, managed by the trustees, is, is to normally be used to support mission and ministry that you're doing with other not-for-profit, like, um, yes, Food, yeah, that's right. Let's forget food. That's the way home. You talk about prison ministries. You can talk about how you relate to um, other not-for-profits within your community. And as long as there was an Episcopal connection at an Episcopal parish, you could apply for funds up to $5,000 that could go towards whatever project you were doing. Well, what the committee um, that runs the Barnabas Fund um, is doing is they will provide 2,500 of, let's say, your 3,000, 3,500 hardware costs and equipment costs, and they will give it to you as a grant. And I believe that Lola will, will tell you, you can go to the parish resource, church resource, and there's a page on the Barnabas Fund, and there's two applications. One is for the what they would do, the normal course of business, and the other would be for this technological grant. And when you fill out the grant, 
and you tell us what it's for and what the project will be and why you're coming and how much of the 2,500 you would need. The moment you hit submit, it comes to me. And in another email, you provide the backup to the costs, a more in-depth uh, conversation about why you're doing this. And then I have the ability to say, yes, it makes it, um, and send you a check for $2,500. Isn't that right, Scott? <laughs> yes, Judy. <laughs> our, our system was as a result of the Barnabas Fund. Thank you, thank you. So um, we, they are graciously doing this one time. There's no time limit on it. If you get into it in the fall and you get into it in January of 2021, it doesn't matter. It's available for, if you request, up to $2,500 for equipment costs. So I expect lots of emails tomorrow. So if I did my math right, Judy and Scott, Scott is really, they're, they're gonna net um, about $1,000 worth they're gonna pay out for their entire five camera system, lighting, sound, et cetera, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's amazing, thank you, Judy. Well, we've had six parishes come forward and I will tell you, they're all different, all are different. Um, but the other thing I want to say is that, and Cindy didn't know this, there's an advance and development fund, which is a resource. So let's say you're going to put in the type of system that St. Peter's, TJ Thomas, and, and, and Jeff Ross are doing. Well, there's a possibility this might be an option for you to find a way to finance it, maybe get another grant, um, maybe if you're really challenging your, your parish, you can do a challenge grant and bring down. So once again, I'm always available for those conversations. So depending upon your size, we have a one size fits all, and then we have a larger option. So I just thought I'd mention that as well. Yeah, and we all know how to get a hold of you. Yes, you do. Yes, that's true. Uh, before we go to question and answers, I'm pleased that we have plenty of time to do that. I want to uh, go over to Martha Kirkpatrick and ask her, is there anything that you need to mention, Martha, you feel that we should mention in regard to today's conversation in light of the new normal task force and the regathering document? Uh, thanks, Cindy. No, I really, I'm, I'm here to answer questions. Um, I, you know, I think um, people's experience with um, streaming has been really um, Pretty remarkable in terms of the um, the attention and the the views that people are getting. Um, so I would just um, reinforce how important it is, and and we do ask that if you're if you are um, starting to think about reopening in person, that you you know maintain um, the ability to do online uh, worship because so many people are dependent on it and won't be coming out um, anytime soon. Just don't feel comfortable with it and the health news is not that encouraging. Um, so this is just makes this all the more important that you know, we really continue to enhance the skills to be able to reach people this way. So that's all, that's all I have to say at this point. Okay. Thanks, Martha, and thanks for uh, hanging out with us today um, to answer any questions. That's all of, the, of what the presenters have to present today. Uh, I know that there's a lot of information. I know I, for one, talked very quickly uh, just so we could get through it. Please know that our information, how to get a hold of us, is up in the top of the chat box. And uh, now, why don't we go ahead and go to questions. Again, you can raise your hand digitally. You can wave at us. Um, you're on a couple different screens, so we hope we see you. And then Lola, if you see unanswered questions in the chat box, please let us know. Yes, there are a few. Um, and thanks to the people who answered as we went along. Um, one uh, question from near the beginning, how do you test a live stream beforehand? Scott, you want to take that question? You, we talked about that yesterday. Yeah. Um, for, for Facebook Live, if you're doing it from a mobile device, you cannot test directly to a page. That's right. Um, you, you can do it from the desktop version of the software, but not from the mobile app. Um, 
But good thing is everybody who is an admin has a personal um, profile and you can test to your personal profile. Um, you just go in there and, and when it says um, under, when you get the streaming um, graphic up, when it says the group or whatever you're gonna stream to, you can choose yourself. You can actually choose other people. You can customize it and select a group if you wanted some people to actually give you some feedback or you can just do it to yourself. And then you can later go back and if you save it to it, you can go back and watch it on the Facebook feed um, to see how, how it did. Okay. Um, one other question. Um, have you merged the, v the Mevo video with the output from the church sound system? I'm currently installing that now. Um, we were taking it from the, the, the church sound system directly into another mixer, which will be the, it's a USB mixer and the USB, uh, the RJ45, can go either into um, the Mevo, the central Mevo system, or into the laptop uh, for the OBS software. There's That's one, how it's done. There's one more thing I'll, I'll add to what Scott just said, and it probably seems redundant, uh, but it's, it's worth mentioning, which is that the people who are watching your live stream at home only hear whatever comes through a microphone. Uh, which is pretty self-explanatory when somebody's up to the lectern reading a lesson. It's a lot less uh, obvious when somebody's singing or there's an instrument playing in the room. You know, the, the person who's sitting in the pew hears all the ambient sound and experiences that, you know, as sitting in the, in the building. Um, but you need to be mindful of installing microphones to pick up ambient sound as well as direct sound, uh, either from a lapel mic or from a, um, from a lectern. Yeah, our plan is we actually have an XLL jack out in the middle of the sanctuary, and we're going to be putting an ambient mic that will mix in with the other so that people get the ambient as well as the directional microphones. You almost never want for singing um, to have that microphone right on top of the person right. uh, you know, for a good ambient sound. You want the, the acoustic of the, the church to help with that and then pick up that sound. There was a question um, very near the beginning, and it was directed to Matt, but I believe that Nate answered it, which was, could you share the app to measure your wireless around a building? But I think that was answered. Um, another question, what about a dedicated spot in the church for the webcam? And, and I think you may have covered that with a range of options there. Are, there, are they asking about having a webcam? It says, what about a dedicated spot in the church for the webcam? TJ, you, your experience with the webcam too, why don't you go ahead and tell us your thoughts on that? Yeah, so there's really two approaches to that. If you're doing online worship only, you can put the camera any place you want. And as Cindy said, closer is better. You know, you have the flexibility to run cables and put a camera right in front of the altar, multiple cameras, anything you want to make the experience at home as good as possible. Um, it's a little more challenging when you start doing hybrid worship, which is where most of us are heading. That's to say online and in-person worship. That's where you probably need to give a little more thought. I think Scott was talking about this earlier to camera placement so that the folks at home get a good view of what's going on, but it doesn't detract from the worship experience of the people in the room. Uh, it just takes a little more intentionality and certainly a, a custom installed system is probably the least obtrusive of all those those options. But I think it's doable with Mevos and other sorts of cameras, given the right uh, intentionality about placement. Good, thank you. Um, sorry, a question that came in to those of you who stream over both Facebook and YouTube, like St. Peter's, why do you choose one over the other? And I think Jeff did answer that. Yeah, he did. And, and I, I think I spoke to it also. Really just uh, more platforms equals broader reach. And then one final question. Um, and I think that was partly covered. Approximate cost of the professional system. I know there's a range. So yeah, what would it be? It depends on the size of your building, how many cameras, how many microphones, what the technological setup is. Uh, for 
you know, for a size of a building like St. Peter's, our investment is roughly $60,000. Uh, but that's starting from the ground up since we, we pretty much gutted everything that was there uh, for AV equipment before and we're, we're building it from the ground up since we have that opportunity with, uh, with the renovation project. I do um, want to say, if I can add to what TJ was saying though too, you know, one of our shut-ins found out that we were looking at this system and she issued a challenge grant and she said that um, she offered to pay for a th up to a third of it if uh, people would match. And people matched because they, they cared for her, because they loved her, because they wanted to be part of her. And I, I would just say as the pastor, I would encourage you to talk to your congregation if you're gonna do something like this, to let them know what you're thinking of doing and, and don't be surprised if others don't wanna help uh, cover the cost of putting in a system. Ours. Ours is pretty elaborate because we're going to have a monitor for a bride and, and grieving family room. We're going to have a monitor in the sacristy uh, and a whole room dedicated to it. It doesn't have to be 60000 but I think the money is out there in your congregations. And long term, as a mission of the church, beyond this pandemic, having the ability to connect your shut-ins and folks who, who are away, um, for us, we've we've it's just been wonderful. I mean, we've been doing streaming for a while, but not as professionally, anywhere near as professionally as we are now. But this is, I think, the shape of what the church needs to do and be in the future, so. Um, and some more questions came in, Cindy. Um, is the Mevo the only camera option that works? Yeah. No, no, there's, there's, <laughs> there's lots of good choices out there. We, we just picked Mevo as out of the box, easiest to get started with. Um, to get the multi views on the Mevo, does the camera stay in one place? Hold on, Lolo. I'm going to go back to the other question. There is several camera options out there and you'll want to explore them. And maybe if you have the AV professional come in, you can talk to them. But we will say the Mevo is an inexpensive option that is proven to work well and other dioceses are, are using them too uh, in big venues as well as small venues. Anyway, go ahead. Back to you, Lola. Thank you. Um, to get the multi views on the, Mev on the Mevo, does the camera stay in one place? I think yeah. that was probably Scott. Yes, yes, it does stay in one place. The seven scenes that I, I do currently and just with the one Mevo, I never move the camera. It's digital, you just zoom it and you preset the scenes. That's the nice thing about that. And what I, I wanna go back and say, the Mevo is not the only option, but very few have the scene capability that the Mevo has built into it right off the bat. And the new start cameras come with NDI, which lets you plug it into switcher um, software much quicker now. Um, thank you, another question. A two-part question. What is the best way or the best format to use if you are taping at different locations and then editing these in? And does the Mevo allow you to edit in or do you need an editing program? So there's that, that is definitely a two-part question. If you're <laughs> looking to pre-record your entire liturgy and then have it premiere or go live uh, at a certain time, all you need is video editing software on your Mac or PC. You take all those parts and you edit it together into a, into a continuous liturgy. We did that one Sunday um, and it's a lot of uh, pre and post production work. If you're looking to do that live on the fly to switch between um, a live camera in the room and pre-recorded material, then you need something similar to OBS uh, switching software so that you can go back and forth between those two things. Uh, Mevo uh, out of the box does not have a way to do that. You cannot use the Mevo to play back pre-recorded video. To do that, you have to run the Mevo through your computer and then use the computer to determine which input you want. Right. I think, you know, it looks to me too, like you're, if, they're if this person asking the question, I think Cindy Farabak, if you're looking to pre-record your entire service, you don't have to have a Mevo, any video camera, any iPhone, any iPad. If you use an iPhone or iPad, you can use iMovies to put that together. Um, Danny Schwears is here, and I know that that's what they're doing at 
um, Sam's and they're doing a fabulous job with it. So pre-recording a service and putting it out there is different than what we're talking about in the Mevo live stream. Uh, would, would you agree, Scott? Yes, absolutely. And you can use a Mevo to pre-record too. Um, it's got okay. a little, a little uh, chip in it that you Micro can take SD out. Micro SD card. Yep. Okay. That's all the questions I see. Does anybody else have questions? No. Jeff, I know we, uh, Jeff is on our panel. Do you have anything else to add, Jeff, that you'd like to share today? No, just what I was saying earlier, I would really encourage you to think of not just doing this for this crisis, but thinking of this as a part of the long-term mission of your congregation and carefully make selections that, that are going to be manageable for you, um, not just during this time, but in the future and are gonna meet your needs. Um, we're so blessed to have what Judy Gregory and, and the Barnabas Fund makes available. We're so blessed to have Cindy and her team uh, willing to help. So really take the time to think this through as a congregation and make the investment in a long-term solution for the good and future of your congregation. Thank you, Jeff, uh, that too. Um, Thank you, and, and thanks everybody for being here. I, of course, the panel, I, I, uh, um, the, what you had to offer today is just a blessing to everybody. Um, Pegasus Technologies, uh, I, learning more about Wi-Fi, I still don't, I still don't get it all, um, but I know, Nate, you're there to, to answer my questions all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just say one thing, you know, uh, Scott and TJ brought up a lot of, of good ideas, but they also brought up a lot of ideas. So if you're coming out of this meeting, wondering how you can get from where you are right now to where TJ is, that's where I'm going to come in. I'm the one that can help you get from point A to point B. Think of me not so much as a tech guy, but your liaison into this world. So any questions? Any thoughts you need somebody to come out and kind of poke around your church and, and find out what you need? You know, myself, I, I'll be here to help you out with that. Matt Tucker will be here. We can talk about it outside of the meeting. So uh, Cindy has my information. I believe our inf Pegasus information is up at the top there. And that's what I want to make sure that I'm your advocate here. I'm here to help you get from point A to point B. Okay. Thank you. Remember to reach out if you need anything. Uh, we're here to help you. We want to help you. Uh, it's just going to be a great way as we go forward, even when COVID's behind us, to spread the good news and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am very excited about this. Um, if there is no more questions, uh, we're, we're coming to a close. I'd like to turn to Martha Kirkpatrick and see if she would um, send us off. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Well, gracious God, we navigate in the wilderness with a great many challenges and things that are falling away and things that are being made new. And we thank you, Lord, for all the ways in which you are showing us that we can reach people, that we can touch people, that we can bring the good news, that we can connect with each other. We ask, Lord, that you continue to guide and bless us as we go forth into this world, we hope, bearing a glimmer of your light into a world that desperately needs it. And we give you thanks, Lord, for all of those on this call today who have helped us and shared their wisdom and their knowledge. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.